All right, everyone. Good afternoon. It's time to talk to Miami football here at Mark Riders TV, the voice of college football, Miami Hurricanes Live, our 64th edition. Uh, this time we do it with the wholesome one. You can join him on his YouTube channel, the wholesome one, Holloway. Man, how you doing today? I'm doing well. Glad to be back on Mark Rogers TV. It's been a while, man. Schedules have been a little uh, different as of what you know what's going on in the world. So it's uh, glad to be on and glad to bring some good news for our Kings. And uh, number one thing is recruiting right now. Yeah, we'll let everyone know that uh, please join in. Leave your comments, your questions, your debate topics there in the live chat. For those of you joining us on Facebook, we appreciate that as well. We've just uh, been able to strike up the Facebook Live just here in the last couple of weeks. But if you want to join in the live chat, you're going to have to uh, jump on over to YouTube and uh, jump in the live chat there uh, to bring us your comments and questions. Also, uh, keep in mind that uh, we're going to dive in the comments that have been left to our videos over the last couple of weeks. And uh, the wholesome one's going to take all comers here. All comments, all questions, he's going to do it. And if I've got anything to say, you can be sure that I'll dive in as well. Uh, but we're going to start with the recruiting process and the, the progress that's been made by this program just in the last few days with the Palmetto Trio. Yeah, we have made we have made great gains at Miami Palmetto, um, a place that historically we probably haven't done that well. I mean, of course, you know, Miami Northwestern and Miami Booker T. Washington, schools like that. And St. Thomas earlier on, not recently, but man, these, this trio of the Palmetto kids have actually put us in their top five or top six. And it's, it's big time. You all know that when Miami is doing well, one thing that they can do is rush the pass up front. And, this five-star defensive tackle, Leonard Taylor, is big time, man. Six foot four, uh, 255 pounds. I think he's probably a little bigger than that now. Uh, this was from his uh, – right before his fall season way out. He had 26 TFLs and 11 sacks just this previous season. Now, we also made the top five with a lot of other SEC teams, as you would know, LSU, Florida, Auburn, and Tennessee. Uh, and Tennessee, one of the teams that has been doing amazing right now in recruiting up there with North Carolina and Ohio State, uh, teams that are rolling right now. So it's actually very well for the University of Miami to be put in the same context with those teams right now. I mean, Auburn, that's a team that you're going to hear a lot of today also that has put a footprint in South Florida or in Florida, period, going in and grabbing a couple of the defense alignment that come out in which we all know a lot of big time defense alignment don't come out of this state. And when they do, they don't come to the U unfortunately, but we made his top five. And one thing about Leonard, man, he jumps off the screen. I mean, he has like DN get off speed. His first step is elite gets up the field, has a nice rip, has nice disengagement skills. You can tell that their whole, the whole D-line is either four or five stars, so they have some really good coaching over there at Miami Palmetto. I mean, the way that they can rush the passer and stop the run at Miami Palmetto, if we can get a couple of those guys over to Miami, really help us in some of our problems in getting after the QB and stopping the run, especially as interior linemen. Um, a lot of people have them locked in as a, as a gator. A lot of people have Leonard Taylor going up to Gainesville. But as of late, there's been a lot of Zooms and a lot of recruitment from the Miami coaches. And that speaks dividends. I mean, what's going on right now in the world? You got to kind of take your best shot at these guys because they're at home. They're local right now. You can call and talk to mom at any time. You know, you can go in and on in and um, get a nice Zoom in if the, if the young man wants to sit and talk with you and, and illustrate to them what you can do for them. And as of late, since Manny Diaz has come here to the University of Miami, the one position that has done well. Now, of course, you had safety, you've had corner, you've had linebacker, but the one core group that has done really well here in Miami in its defensive line, whether it's D tackles or whether it's defense ends. And now we have to start getting the benefits of those players previous, resulting in on-field success with recruiting 
What I mean by that is bringing in top-notch defensive ends and defensive tackles to add to the production that has already been made uh, by the Miami Hurricanes on the defensive front. Got to tell you, Wholesome One, you're not kidding when you're talking about these uh, kids' credentials coming out of high school. Uh, Leonard Taylor, as you mentioned, is a five-star, number one rated defensive tackle in the country. The country, yes, sir. Number one in the country, second rated player, according to the 247 Sports Composite, player in Florida, fourth ranked player in the country. Quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, everything taken into consideration, regardless of position, mm -hmm. we are talking – yeah, top, top talking, list, top Just one percentile elite, guy, elite skill set, talent, uh, ceiling out of this world. Corey Collier, number three rated player at his position at safety. So again, you're talking to top three position player uh, at safety. Uh, he's a top 180 player in the country. And if you don't follow recruiting uh, on a regular basis, uh, once you get into that top 300 level, you want those guys. Yeah. Uh, not absolutely. that you're not going to find players outside the top 300. You definitely are. You got to build most of your roster outside the top 300. But a top 180 player in the country, regardless of position, that's big time. Uh, Bashard Smith, I hadn't gotten to his numbers quite yet. Uh, we got a uh, question coming in, wholesome one from. Let me find it. Let me find it. Nathan Bennett asking about uh, Deshaun Troutman. Don't know if you're familiar with him. Deshaun Troutman's 38th rated inside linebacker. Uh, he's in the Miami area as well as a three star. Yes, he is. It's really wild that that comes up. I was actually doing my eval on him for my recruiting update videos that I give out around this time of year. And yeah, he's a three star. That is from Edwards Water, uh, Florida, and he's a local guy. He's a headhunter. I mean, he's six foot one. He's already two hundred and fifteen pounds right now, you know. And and that's a guy who we start talking about linebacker the position. Of course, historically at Miami, that's something that I try to get away from. You know, I don't want to do the whole Von Miller, you know, Ray Lewis conversation. Dan Morgan. We we all know those names. What we need to do is get names like Shaq Quarterman and Michael Pinckney and, and Zach McLeod. We needed those guys to make those big steps. And they've laid a, actually a pretty nice foundation for the linebackers moving forward here at Miami. Now we have Zach McLeod. Now we have Avery Huff. Now we have Sam Brooks, guys that can come in that are big but also fast. Some could even be listed as some bigger safeties, meaning that Miami is finally getting modern with the way that we're playing defense. Number one thing we did, 2018, go full sail into the 425. Now it's bringing in safeties and turning them into linebackers. And uh, that's what we did with Avery Huff. So that's big time. Now, when it comes to Deshaun Troutman, you know, I think that he's he's someone that we definitely need to be recruiting. Not saying that he isn't Miami caliber by any means, but Right now, we're taking swings at the top guys. I mean, you saw last recruiting class, we went after the number one inside linebacker and fell short of him when he chose to go to Oregon over Miami, even though he reached for the Miami hat and kind of hurt my heart a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, but, yeah, I think that Deshaun Troutman is definitely a Miami caliber guy. I would love if they were to take a commitment from him because the way that he has his trajectory, he's a guy you want on the team now. Before the Auburns, before the Floridas, before the Tallahassee start calling and offering, you might want to get this guy on the train wearing the U, happy to be a cane because the way that he is, he's growing. I mean, just last year, he was a borderline two-star. Now he's shooting, and they're talking to make him a four-star. So you want these type of guys on your squad and wanting to be Miami Hurricanes because the way his trajectory has gone, I mean, he was an 81, now he's an 88. According to 247, it's a nice jump. That is a nice 85. Excuse me. He's an 85 right now, according to 247. My, my misread. Folks, if you shop Amazon, and a ton of you do, of course, uh, grab the link in the description section of any of the videos. You help us build the channel. So it's the same shopping experience. Doesn't cost you a dime more. Grab the link at Amazon and help us build the channel. We got the wholesome one on the line. Got to check out his YouTube channel. If you love the U, that's a must. Need I say nothing more. 
But if you love the ACC, you love college football in general, you keep up with the big programs, you still check them out. Uh, the Wholesome One, Wholesome One Holloway uh, right here on YouTube. So do that. And uh, we remind you that the Super Chat's available today. And uh, also bring your comments and your questions to the live chat. And meanwhile, I'm going to uh, go to um, some of our recent videos and those questions that have come in. So it's been a hot topic concerning Mike Rump's ability or inability to bring in recruits. Uh, I'll go to Damian Hernandez question, but really extended past this to just his overall performance and where you would rate uh, Mr. Rump at this point. Uh, Damien's comment is uh, that he's heard rumors that the cornerback offers that come in have to be approved by uh, Manny and Banda before Rump can extend an offer. Not sure if it's accurate, but it would make a lot of sense. With that in mind, our cornerback recruiting has been way below average the last four years. The first half of that statement is correct. It does. The defensive backs are evaluated by Efren Banda and Manny Diaz, safeties and corners. Now, if for those of us that know college football, every program has their slight differences. Miami's cornerback coach, Mike Rump, does not offer offers. It's the defensive coordinator who offers offers, and Efren Banda. Okay. In that situation, you see that – when if you were to Google or 247 anyone, for those of you who are watching right now, my live squad who's watching, if you were to take any recruit that comes to mind right now, type in their name, go to 247, and I want you to look at their primary and secondary recruiting. And then I want you to come back and I want you to tell me why everyone keeps attacking Mike Gruff and he's not the primary recruiter for cornerbacks. Now, why that is. I do not know. I don't work at the University of Miami. But what I do know is that with any simple search, you will see that Efren Banda is the one recruiting these corners. Until late in the night, around like January 30th, right before we're about to have the National Signing Day, Mike Rum rolls in the SEC country and finds a nice six foot two SEC caliber corner to come play for the Miami Americans. And then he gets credit for that player, that prospect. But if you were to look at any of your top-notch corners, you look at your Corey Collier, it's Efren Banda and Manny Diaz. You look at Marshall, it's Efren Banda and Manny Diaz. Any of those guys, it does not say Mike Ruff. So, it, and it's funny because it's one of those things to where he's going to get the brunt of the blow. Why? Because he's the cornerback's coach. And in most people's eyes and what most people think is that the position coaches is your primary recruiter. That isn't true. I mean, Stephen Fields was Justin Flo's primary recruiter, not Pat, not Coach Packy, not Blake Baker. It was Stephen Fields who coaches tight ends. <laughs> it's about regional recruiters. You know, why would I have someone who's from, let's say someone from Georgia who happens to be my linebackers coach, he has all of his the uh, connections he has is in the state of Georgia. Therefore, I would want him to be my Georgia primary recruiter, whether that be wide receiver, whether that be corner, whether that be QB, he knows the coaches in the area and the quality of football in that state. So therefore, he's going to be the one that we send to recruit that state. It doesn't mean that if we miss a Miami linebacker, we should blame the linebackers coach, theoretically, who was from Georgia, who recruits the state of Georgia. So, like I said, when it comes to defensive backs at Miami, that goes through head coach Manny Diaz and co-coverage defensive coordinator Efren Bender. Got the wholesome one talking Miami football. This is our 64th edition. Want to remind you and let you know, actually, for the first time that uh, we've got another edition coming up this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern time with uh, Cam Underwood. So we talk as much Miami football. We talk college football here across the board. So wholesome one, um, you know, somebody was jumping on me big time. I mean, you know, I'll take my critics as you do as well. But man, this guy was relentless last week, just that I don't cover anybody except Ohio State, Miami and Florida State. But uh, if they look at the videos, they would see otherwise. And they would also got to realize I'm one guy. 
Yeah. So one guy can't cover every team in the country. So we do the best we can. Uh, people respond to Miami. They respond to other teams. And I would love to bring in a fan base. Hey, you want to bring me in the Iowa fan base? Hey, I'll do an Iowa live stream every week. Would love to do it. So, you know, that has something to do with it as well. I'm looking at the recruiting rankings according to 247 Sports right now for 2021. And I'm leading into this question by uh, Kure Walker concerning uh, keeping hanging on to the elite athletes in the area. Mm -hmm. So Kure Walker saying in regards to recruiting, what are your thoughts about Miami not being able to keep the elite at home? And I'm seeing that the Canes, despite coming off a six and seven campaign, are 14th in the country right now. And so let's let's understand that. Let's also understand that there are just so many prospects in their area that they can't sign them all. If you oh. signed every four and five recruit, star recruit in uh, the county surrounding uh, campus, you wouldn't be able to sign them all. You don't have enough slots. It's like one of the unique uh, situations in the country where even if you wanted all the four and fives and they all wanted to go to Miami, they couldn't. No, nope. that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I'll make a prediction right now and God bless these programs, but Minnesota is not going to hang on to the number nine ranking. Iowa's not going to hang on to the 10th ranking and Maryland's not going to hang on to number 13. So let's, let's back off and let's also understand that uh, the 14th rated class in the country is not at all bad. So what are your thoughts about uh, the elite not staying home? Number one, we got to give them a reason to. I mean, I hear a lot of people say, you know, they, they want to go. They, these kids want to go here. These kids want to go there. There's nothing like staying home and playing for your hometown squad. Whether you grew up rooting for the school or not, whether you grew up a Tallahassee guy or, or a Florida Gator, doesn't really matter. There's nothing like being able to play in front of your family and friends at the local college that is a big time brand. It's just that simple. But we, as the University of Miami fans, have to understand that there's no way in the world we expect to hold on to big time four and five star recruits going 13 and 13 in the last two years. It's, it's just, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. And, and what, there 26 is. of 16 the last three years. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you can't you can't have it both ways. So what we have to do now is you got to win as a pro. It's just that simple at Miami. What came to that eighth ranked recruiting class in 2018 was the fact that we had just went 10 and three the season what eight weeks before that national signing day even though it was a three-game losing streak to Pitt and Clemson and Wisconsin. Either way, you win two, get 10 games, you go to the Orange Bowl, you get the eighth-ranked recruiting class. Bomb. Now, we have to do things on the football field to make sure that their success continues as far as understanding that, yeah, the ACC Coastal, to those of us who saw Miami at its heights or seen the U and the U Part Two and things of that nature, we – Look at that logo and still think, yeah, just one more year. Just pull it all together. We got this. Has to be a complete culture change. And that's one thing I spoke about on my live last night. Uh, it's, a, it's a culture change going on in a program that Coach Manny Diaz is fishing out a lot of the guys that uh, – not necessarily fishing out, meaning kicking people out, but fishing out that mindset and trying to get people to understand that yeah, we play in the ACC Coastal, but we haven't dominated the ACC Coastal. So we can't look at North Carolina and Duke as basketball schools. Nah, you're on a two-game losing streak to Duke, so they're not a basketball school. Because if they are, then what does that make us? Lacrosse? We have to go out here and win these football games. And we can't keep doing it with the T-word. What I mean by the T-word is talent. We can't just keep leaning on that. No, they're schemes. There's how we're going to get down this field. There's how we're going to stop these people. How are we going to work together as a team? How are we going to come to the sideline and discuss what was going on on the field? Our communication, our preparation, all of those type of things we have to start doing at a high level. You got to start out winning your division. Give me three years straight in the ACC championship game. And then we can start talking about holding guys here elite because then – what we play eight, eight uh, 
conference games, Mark? You know that, yes. right? Eight conference games. There you go. Go undefeated in your in division three years straight. See how that feels. See how that feels to play in the ACC championship game in Charlotte three straight seasons. Then, of course, you got four non-conference, so you at least go 500 in that. What does that make you? 10 and 2. It sounds simple. I know it isn't that simple, but I'm saying if we want to start climbing that ladder again, that was stolen away from us in 2003. We're not going to get into that. But if we want to ever get back to that level again, we have to start from the ground up and realize we are not where we used to be. And that's all right. It's, it shouldn't be something that we're like, oh, well, we're not great anymore. Let's just give up. No. Yeah, we're not there anymore. How do we get back there? OK, we got to modernize the offense. We modernize the defense. We bring in a new strength and conditioning staff. All right, let's start playing 2020 ball, not 2014 or 2004 ball. It doesn't work like that anymore. And I think Coach Manny Diaz and his staff are working on doing that. Our man JT Sounds is bringing up the name of Nyland Green. Don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's the eighth rated cornerback in the nation. Number 10 prospect out of Georgia. The crystal ball projection on 247 Sports is Clemson on down the line. Uh, but uh, wanting to know if this prospect out of Covington, Georgia, has, has any possibility of coming to the U. I actually do not know much about Nyland Green. Uh, I know that I was a big Jason Marshall guy for a long time and knew deep down that if we didn't start pulling some wins, we weren't going to get that type of guy. I mean, he is your plug and play starting press corner right now uh so Niall and green unfortunately i do not know and i don't want to speak on somebody i don't have to do some more eval on him but if you say he's the eighth best corner in the nation yeah number eight uh cornerback in the nation uh, yeah, that's, that's that's prospect out of uh georgia that's big time and he's and he's from a football state that's big time i mean him going to clemson i could definitely understand like i said they're winning right now now, what's going to happen to Clemson once, if and they ever go back to eight, nine wins? We'll see. Uh, but right now, they're rolling. And what was Dabo Sweeney's thing? We got to win the ACC Atlantic. <laughs> you know, he recruited. He brought in a staff. He brought in a system that would win in the ACC Atlantic. It took him a little bit. But once he got over that hump, he never looked back. Now, if we can replicate that on the ACC Coastal side, then over the 2020s, we should be doing pretty well for ourselves. Malik Neighbors is a 2021 uh, class guy, uh, number 251 in the nation, 47th rated wide receiver, 8th rated player out of Louisiana at wide receiver. Know anything about him? Gunner Rich asking about Malik Neighbors. Man, you, mm. <laughs> jump off the screen. That's it gets me excited to talk skill positions being a, a, a lion in my entire life, as you guys can see, big guy. But either way, <laughs> uh, it, it's always really, really nice to see those type of uh, wide receivers like Malik that jump off the screen as soon as you turn on the film. I mean, instantly you pop it in there, you're like, whoa. You know, that guy shouldn't be moving that fast. <laughs> you know, it's whether it's jump balls, whether it is uh, disengaging from tacklers, whether it's on punt kick return. You talk about bringing in a program and turning it around. It's filling your skill positions and, of course, O-line, D-line, but filling your skill positions on defense and on offense with big-time playmakers. And Malik is one of those guys. Evan Neal's currently at IMG Academy. So he's the uh, number one rated offensive tackle, third rated player in Florida. He's committed to – No, Evan Neal already plays for Alabama. Yeah, he plays for Alabama. I yeah, he was class of 2008. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, just pulled him up. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where we're going with that comment. But to, no, yeah. He's basically just bringing up the fact that Evan Neal was one who was reported. His family loved Miami, grew up a Miami Hurricanes fan. Uh, and we went on that 7-6 and six season in 2018, so he went to Alabama instead. So. MSU number one fan, De'Ara King, is the starting quarterback at Miami. I can no answer question. that question. Okay. All right. Bring the comments, uh, the questions to the uh, live chat. We will uh, throw them at the wholesome one. And please, in the meantime, head on over to his channel as soon as we're done here. Check out the videos and subscribe. Uh, and uh, definitely get that 
done, make that a priority. Uh, our guy, Nate, I believe he's brought this up in the past. Oh, he, he wants this rivalry. Back. <laughs> oh, man. Nate, man, you must have been around in the 80s, man. Sheesh. No, I think Nate's a young dude. I think he's like 18 years old. I've talked to wow. him. <laughs> he must watch a lot of documentaries or something, man, because he's just love this. Oh, man, what is he going to say? He wants to see Harvard yell all night long? Jeez. Wholesome one. Certain people just want to get your goat a little bit, uh, get after you there, throwing oh, down, you oh, know, God. UCF running the state. Well, they have a point. They, they they have a point, man. I mean, UCF has an argument to 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 be in the big three as of late. I will have to give them that. And that's something that in your fandom you eventually have to start letting go that if we don't hold on to this, we don't start producing, man, oh, man, some of, the, some of these teams, I mean, Lane Kiffin, when he was at FAU, they were rolling for a little bit there. Uh, but UCF has been consistently doing pretty well. I don't know about running the state, but they're they're up for conversation. Yeah, if, if there is a premier program in the state right now, I don't think it's really debatable. Florida's had the most success recently. Oh, yeah. They've oh, yeah. uh, turned in two consecutive top 10 teams, 11 and 2, 10 and 3 the last two years, have won major bowls the last two years. So it's not even debatable right this second. That can change rather quickly. It's not... Uh, like Florida State and Miami have nothing to go on. They've got generally top 15 to 20 talent on the roster. UCF has had those three really good seasons in a row. So, uh, But we, we can't look at their record and compare it to the other three's record that they're obviously playing in the ACC and the SEC and what UCF is is doing. Uh, wholesome one. So we get JT Sounds back on here. Once What's you evaluate the, the cornerback room. Yeah, it's um, it's a tough subject. Reason being, it's a place to where and I talk about this a lot. There's a difference between being young and inexperienced. And one of the worst things you want to be in college football is young and inexperienced at any position. Meaning, you got guys who are within their first or second year in the program and don't have much on game experience in-game and on-field experience. And at cornerback, if we were to be able to hold on to Al Blaze Jr. and uh, DJ Ivory would be the first time we've had two starting senior corners in well over a decade and a half. Because we always have guys that leave on us because, you know, they get picked on and they have a whole bunch of sacks. Uh, it's, not, it's not sacks, interceptions. I mean, you look at Artie Burns, he went and had a six sack, a six, I keep saying sack. Wow. Six interception season and takes off. I mean, he was a first rounder, but uh, I definitely think that our best cornerback is Al Blaze Jr. I think that DJ Ivy has steps to take forward. But I also remember that both of these young men were 19 years old, starting big time D1 ball at Miami. Is it their fault? No. Is it? Us missing on a lot of corners as of late? Absolutely. So I think that we have a lot of work on there. I mean, we brought in some really nice guys. We got two nickel corners now uh, in to Corey Couch and Marcus Clark. So that's pretty good. And we also have six foot two Isaiah Dunson coming in from Georgia. Big, big corner. And then you have six foot one uh, Christian Williams. So we have six scholarship corners on the roster right now with a couple of other defensive backs who could play corner as far as their athleticism. But the technique and the way that they want the corners to play at Miami as far as eyes and hands, something I truly disagree with. I mean, any marquee corner plays the dang football, meaning they look, locate, and contest the football, not wait until you catch it and then try to rake it out of your hands. But – it seems to be that's what Coach Benny Diaz wants his defense to do. So that's what happens at Miami. So Martin chimes in. Martin uh, brings us some really good questions and comments. Uh, we appreciate his support. Uh, and if I remember correctly, coming all the way from Africa, mm -hmm. Martin, uh, watching Miami football. So uh, want to know about Troutman, which you, you outlined uh, everything that you feel about the young man in regards to his ability on the field and why he's only a three-star? 
I think since he's a late bloomer, I think that's the only reason why. I mean, he has the prototypical size. Like I said, he's six foot one, two ten right now. And he's going into his senior year, which means he's going to be pushing maybe 225, 230 coming into uh, his freshman year. And he plans to early enroll at whatever institution he picks. Uh, I think if I were to be a little bit more critical, I would have to say maybe speed. I don't know his 40 time. Yeah, 247 doesn't have his 40 time listed, but he plays fast film wise. Now, maybe his straight line speed in the 40 is maybe like 4'6", four, 4'65", six, four, six, somewhere in there. Um, when you talk about elite linebackers in today's high school and college football, everybody's out here running like 4'4", four, four, you know, 4'5", late, like 4'8". Like they're moving as the top tier linebacker. So I do understand where he's coming from with that. But – as a three-star linebacker, that's perfectly fine. I would love to grab him right now. Like I said earlier, I want to grab him now before all the big SEC schools come and try to grab the young man from under our nose. So, Anthony Mendez, we're going to serve this one up, but I'm looking at uh, Albert Regis's profile, and I'm seeing absolutely no connection to Florida or Miami in any way. So I see Albert Regis as the 32nd-rated defensive tackle. Mm -hmm. He's out of Texas. He committed to Minnesota. I do not see Miami on his list. I see Minnesota, Baylor, Houston, Illinois, Louisiana. Anthony, don't know why you're asking about Albert Regis in particular, but uh, I don't know if you've heard the name, know him, anything. Oh, yes, about he's definitely state. a Miami okay. target. I don't know if we've okay. offered him just yet, but he was a name that uh, has been popping up, just like Deshaun today in Kane's Twitter world, as you are so somewhat a part of because of your – you help uh, guys like me and Cam hop on, but uh, Kane's Twitter world is his own universe, so y'all be careful if you go into there. <laughs> but uh, just make sure if you do come in, you come in with respect because it is wild in there. Anyway, Deshaun and um, uh, Regis are guys who are big time being talked about in, in the Kane's social media right now. So that's why you, I figured we would get a lot of questions about, it, about those two recruits uh, today. Okay. Always plenty of Florida and Florida State fans like to jump in the uh, Miami live stream. And we want to remind everyone that regardless of who you root for, everybody's welcome to talk uh, college football. Oh, yeah. Here. Love you respectful. You're perfectly fine. Man. Absolutely. Come in, trash talk, but do it in a respectful, non-offensive, non-personal way mm -hmm. and just keep it to football. Luke, Luke Walker like winning the Coastal. This should be, if everything goes as planned, which it hasn't in the coastal almost ever. Yeah, uh, isn't it seven Virginia years Tech was really good. Yeah, didn't we do seven years straight, seven different champions? Seven different like champions. That? Virginia <laughs> turned out to be the, the last one. They 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 had to win it this year. So if you're if you go to Vegas and like to play, you, you should have known that already that the Virginia was destined to win it this year because they just had to. There was one more slot and they were the team and they had to win it. Seven different. This just doesn't happen anywhere else. You know, Ohio State dominates their division. Wisconsin pretty much dominates their division. You got Alabama and LSU. You got Georgia. You got the top of the line in, in these divisions. But man, for seven different teams to share that championship, everybody wins it in that division. Uh, and uh, where you would think, based on the talent on the roster, the talent that's available through recruiting and the tradition of the programs and everything taken into consideration, looking at that division, you would think Miami should win it about half the time. You would think in, in a 10-year span, Miami would win that division half the time. And then the other five would be divvied up between North Carolina and Virginia Tech. They would oh, win yeah. one or two, and and Pitt may sneak in, and 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 has happened. And Georgia Tech's been good in the past, but you would think Miami would win that about half the time. The way it looks right now, you would think North Carolina Miami is going to be the game of the year in the Coastal. But again, none of us can predict the Coastal. But the way it looks on paper, mm -hmm. that game should be a heck of a game. And then, you know, the funny part about it is being a Miami fan, you always had this uh, sense of comfort as far as like, oh, well, we'll, we'll win it eventually. You know, we, we'll throw a bomb to this guy or hand it off to Duke Johnson. He'll go 80 or throw one to Philip Dorsett. He'll score. And uh, I think our coaches and players had that feel, too. 
Because if you look at our program, none of those schools should, should be in conversation to win the Coastal. But what have they done? They've out-schemed and out-coached Miami over the last decade and a half. <laughs> and you know what? That's why we've decided to work on it. And Mesh finally put together a modern spread air radius. Spread rate is what we call it in the Canes universe. Offense mixed with the modern 425 defense, man. And uh, to be honest with you, a lot of those teams actually have gotten pretty well. I mean, you look at North Carolina, they've put some guys in the NFL. You look at Georgia recently, uh, Georgia Tech is kind of, you know, up and down. Virginia was rolling for a little second there, but then it came back. Pitt is always a solid, hardworking, hard coach team. And so is Va Tech. Uh, and once we understand that you, you got to be able to show up every single week and any coach you listen to, whether it's Mario Cristobal at Oregon, whether it's coach Nick Saban at Alabama, whether it was coach Obermeyer when he was at Ohio State. One of the things they always say is that it's hard to field the same team every single week. So you have to really implement that into the young men who are under your tutelage, the importance of consistency and rising to the occasion understanding that you are prepared to be in this situation, go out there and make the play. We put you in a situation, make a play on the ball. Don't be scared. It's right there. Make a play. Kane fam 101 reminding everyone to hit that like button. So we do our part by coming on here, giving analysis, posting videos constantly. You do your part by liking the videos, sharing them out on social media. And of course, subscribe to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football and the way that benefits you is you know when we're going live because of people's schedules, because of my personal schedule and work schedule. Don't always know when I can go live, uh, but uh, you're going to know when we're going live by subscribing to the channel. Turn on the bell for the notifications. Voila, you know when we're going to go live. And we got the wholesome one, and we're happy to have him today talking Miami football. Kane fam reminding everyone of that. Uh, Devin Ray in the live chat. We forget about special teams so much. You know, it's it's offense, it's defense. We love talking wide receivers and running backs and in every position on the offense and defense. But a th a, generally, a third of the plays are punts, punt returns, kickoffs, kickoff returns. There's there's some kind of special teams play, two point conversion, PAT, etc. Field goals. Oh my goodness! So. You know, Cam and I were just talking about it last week, and you well know every play of that Florida game is crucial. It came right down to the wire, and had you hit a either one of the two field goals, uh, whether that had been in the first quarter miss or there was a miss sometime in the second half, cool. then when you're coming down the field down 24-20 in the fourth quarter, you don't need a touchdown. You would have only needed a field goal, and you got in the red zone. Man, rewatching that game is one of the toughest things to do as someone who experienced it live. As you know, I was there. Uh, and we've talked about this game at nauseum as far as it was a razor thing between both programs right then. And if you looked at Miami and Florida at the end of that game, you would say, yeah, two nine, ten win programs just played each other, and it was a really, really good game. But what happened is Miami played almost its best and Florida played at its almost absolute worst. And you saw it because both teams went on two different trajectories. Um, and uh, I think that special teams is going to be a, take a really big uh, step up for us. I mean, bringing in uh, Jose Borgales, who uh, beat us when he was at FIU. I think he was five or five on his field goals. I mean, he just was boop, boop, boop. And he'll come off and kick. He'll uh, kick a touchback, kick off, and he's throwing the U down as he's running to the sideline. I mean, he was he was fired up to beat Miami uh, because he went to Booker T. Washington, and Miami didn't want to offer him out of high school, so he had to go to FIU instead of Miami. Uh, and he was like a top three kicker in the state, and Miami didn't offer him. But he eventually came over as a grad transfer, so we're happy about that. Uh, but that's going to be a big step in the right direction for us as uh, my American special teams is making um, making 
our field goals. Please just make our field goals. Um, the other thing is being able to bring these young men in who are the highly sought after four star recruits that now we can be able to have them on our special teams. You know, last year we had um, Murphy as our. Yeah, thank I'm you. Making curveball happy here. We appreciate that. You know, I mean, I've been having a look at that that garnet thing behind your head all day, and I was like, "Where is the you?" But it's all right. I got mine right here. So yeah, wow. much better, much better. Old miss, uh, I don't mind old Miss Lane. Yeah, yeah, make them face each other. Yeah, that's the beautiful part. <laughs> yeah, that's always a great game. Chains in the nose. Anyway, um. Now we will have a four-star running down on Gunner instead of a walk-on. Why? Because we're starting to bring in and get a little bit more of that depth at the defensive back core and linebacking core to where those guys who want to play, they want to get on the field, they have to play special teams because they're seniors and older players uh, in front of them, more experienced players who are starting in the two deep on offense and defense. So, therefore, if they want to make the travel bus, if they want to have, you know, pitches, I know a lot of our – Players are very big on social media. They want pictures of themselves. So, therefore, you want pictures on the field, you got to be on special teams. I mean, I know one thing I've loved about my study of the Ohio State program, uh, especially over the last eight years or so, I've been reading a, a book on Urban Meyer that I really like uh, called Above the Line. Any coach that wants to be a coach, go look at that. Go read that book, Urban Meyer, Above the Line. It's a great book. And uh, he said that any guy that wants to start for him Better had played one whole year on special teams. And that was like a, a rule at Ohio State that he implemented, or that had been around for a while. Uh, and as you can see, they've had a pretty good program over the last half a century. So that's pretty good. Yeah, I'm running numbers for all sorts of videos that I've been posting. So Ohio State, uh, best winning percentage of all time, best winning percentage since 1960, best winning percentage since uh, 2000. And them in Alabama and Clemson, best winning percentage, ba virtually tied in the last, you know, eight or nine years. Uh, I, I think we had this conversation, and I, and I mentioned to you that uh, maybe you've come across it in this book. I don't know. I haven't read the book that uh, Urban Meyer believes in having the players earn their position and the yeah. entire team earn the right to practice in the actual Ohio State facilities. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they go out to some junior high school field and basically <laughs> sleep on mattresses in the hallways until he, whether it takes him three practices or two weeks or whatever it takes to where he said, okay, you're practicing like an Ohio State football team. We're going to bring you back to campus. You can sleep in a decent bed and practice on the nice field and use the nice facilities. But until then, it's, it's all going to be on this uh, – dirt junior high field one of the other things he speaks about in the book is that uh, he would stand as all the players are coming out of the locker room as they're running into the practice field and he would look at them and he would send some back like no you don't you don't look like you want to practice today you know you're not giving off the right energy go back now come back no i it wasn't about like spat tape or gloves or whatever you know he doesn't care about swag you can do whatever you want to do but the aura that you're giving off that energy because he wanted the energy to always be championship, whether he was at Bowling Green, whether he was at Cincinnati, whether he was at Florida, like that's just one of his things is he would stand there. He wouldn't have a GA do it. He wouldn't have an assistant coach do it. He wanted to stand there and look every player in the eyes as they're running by and make sure that they really want to go practice uh, at a high level. I know that I watched uh, a video on YouTube of him with you know, um, the Ohio High School Athletic Association coaching clinic. And mm -hmm. the point that, and he talks a lot about psychology. He's a psychology guy. And one thing that he talked about that was very interesting is <clears throat> if a kid's not learning um, a scheme, a sequence, a technique, whatever it is, a play, that he doesn't blame the kid. He blames the coach and says, everybody learns differently. And if you can't figure out how to reach that kid, whether it's to get in his face, whether it's to pat him on the rear end, tap him on the back, whatever you need to do, build a connection with him. Um, you know, we need to understand that these kids in 2020, it is now, aren't the same as what we coached in 2005 or in 1995 or whenever. And you got to stay up on that and Whoa. you need to connect with the kids and understand how they learn and figure it out. 
<laughs> it's so nice to hear that because it's something that I have tried to explain to people, uh, and and I know that it's it is important. That is something that you you have to be able to get that message conveyed to the players, and it is on the coaches to do that. I mean, of course, the players. You know, they have to put their, their their side into things, too. Showing up to practice, showing up with a good attitude, making sure I'm at meetings, all that, yada, 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 yada. But when they're there, they're basically a piece of clay to a certain extent, theoretically. And you are the potter. You have to shape and mold them to what you want them to be. When they put pen to paper and said that they wanted to play at the University of Miami, they trusted you to make them the best football player that they can be. And it's your job to do so. Shamar Stewart, uh, 6'5", 236, number one rated strong side defensive end, number one rated in Florida, number one rated nationally, according to 247 Sports. So we're talking the class of 2022. I don't know if we want to reach out that far. I didn't realize we're talking about a 2022 guy Oh man, here. But uh, he obviously can play. He's playing in Florida, but he's a few years out. But uh He's number one across the board, according to 247 Sports. It makes you start feeling kind of old. I'm creeping up on my 10-year uh, reunion here. Yeah, don't, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that to me, 10 years. Come on. Uh, my, yeah. my, my number there has got a little wiggle in it. It's not yeah, a one whoa. and a zero. It's getting up there now, huh? It's all good. It's Zachary fun. is asking about Jared Williams. Mm-hmm. The, he would be uh, huge for the offensive line. line. I mean, yeah, it could be huge for Miami. I mean, the issue with us as Miami Hurricanes fans is that we have to understand that um, any offensive player, whether it be the backup QB, whether it be starting running back, starting offensive line, they were touched by Dan Enos and his horrific offense. So we have to judge a lot of these players now in a modern offense, okay? Number two, the fact that we started Zion Nelson and put him in that type of situation at 18 years old, mm, was not a big fan of that at all. You just don't – you don't go out there and destroy a young man's confidence like that. You just don't – it. it you can go from Zion Nelson, you can go from, uh, let's say, Kalyan Herbert, a guy who was in our program for three years at the point at the start of last year. You can go and start him. If he messes up, you can replace him with a freshman Zion Nelson. But you can't go from Zion Nelson to a red shirt sophomore who's sitting on the bench for three and a half years and hasn't done anything and now move him in to be the starter. So theoretically speaking, that was just a bad go. Now, when it comes to Jared, Williams, not Jaron, Jared Williams from Houston. Uh, why not add him to them? I mean, what's the worst that he can bring him over, having him be in uh, and have him be in the flux, especially someone who has the chemistry with uh, De'Aaron King. If he can come in and truly earn a spot, why not? I mean, Houston is very – Houston and the AAC is very comparable to the ACC Coastal. Probably better. <laughs> Some of those teams will probably have come over and won the ACC Coastal, and a couple of those teams probably would have beaten us last year. So why not have him come over and, and, and be a part of it now? Is he going to come and be a savior, or is he going to come be the new first-team all-ACC left tackle? I don't know. What I do know is it would be a great addition to the program. Bring him in, and let's see what he can do. JT Daniels, so with the emergence of uh, Keaton Slovis at USC, throwing 30 touchdown passes off the injury to Daniels last year, uh, he's in the transfer portal. So JT Daniels, a five-star early commit to USC, started right out of the gate as a 17-year-old freshman, now in the transfer portal. A lot of folks, uh, wholesome one, asking about uh, JT Daniels and Martin uh, Dube in particular. Should uh, Miami go after JT Daniels? You're starting to see a trend here, Mark. Every time there's somebody in the transfer portal, every time there's someone brand new, they must be the savior of the U. We're fine on JT. Thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're good. 
Well, of course, he's going to be ready to play for you in 2021 when the Eric King's gone. So can you project? Of course, there's got to be a year of football played, so I'm not holding you to this. But what would be the master plan in regards to who would be the starter in 2021? Uh, Nikosi Perry. Okay. I, I think a, uh, Brett Lashley shaped Nikosi Perry as far as what he's done under a coach who should have never been the QB's coach here. I'll leave it at that. And then Danny knows what he's done when we put him in situations to go out and, and throw the football down the field. He does a very, very, very good job at doing that. Now, there's other things that he can learn. I think this year, as far as being behind De'Ara King, learning and maybe even getting into a couple of those blowout games is going to be huge uh, for Nikosi Perry. And I think he will be the starter versus Alabama come out 2021. So with uh, C-Dog West uh, joining us, I believe, on – no, that's on YouTube, C-Dog West. And also I saw another name in here that I hadn't uh, seen before. I can't find him now, but I appreciate everybody that's joining us for the first time, and we're, we're gaining some viewership over on Facebook Live. So just understand, if you join us on Facebook Live, that's awesome. But if you want to join us in the live chat, you got to jump on over to YouTube. And the best way to spend your, your time with us is you jump in the live chat, you throw us comments and questions, and of course, the Wholesome One will respond to all of those. And in addition to that, I'll jump in on anything that I've got an opinion on. And then as soon as we're done here, John, jump on over to the Wholesome One's uh, YouTube channel. Subscribe there for more Miami football analysis. All right, sir. You know, we're coming to the time that once we determine when this season's going to start, then we can start breaking these positions back down. And that would be great to have you back on to do that. You know, I'm always here for that. I mean, this would be our third year in a row doing this. So uh, I've kind of calmed down every time. My first year doing it, 2018, I was a little, yeah, we're going to do it. <laughs> you know, last year, 2019, I was a little bit more excited about the linebackers than I, than I really uh, probably should have. But now just growing um, in, in my young to be coaching career and, and in my film, understanding that uh, got to pull your fandom a little bit away when you're evaluating prospects. But that doesn't mean that you have to be overly critical and bash them just because, you know. So I'm just trying to find that happy medium. And I think that uh, I would be very, very excited and honored to do a breakdown on my, my fellow Miami Hurricanes players. And just absolutely, you know, that's one of my things right there when, when some people say, you know, I've heard people say, oh, you're bashing this team or you're bashing that team or whatever. And then other people say, you've had all these positive things to say or, you know, your analysis hasn't been that cutting edge because, you know what, I just tell it like it is. And if I don't know, I'll tell you, you know, I don't know about that particular subject. Let me go research it and come yeah. back. But if I've got a strong opinion, I'm not afraid to deliver it. But if I don't bash. So, so we all know on media and especially with the internet, there are people out there that just bash away just, just to get clicks. Oh, they get oh, man, yeah. you need to cut people down at the knees just to do it. Just so I can say, man, I, I'm the authority and I just lay waste to everyone. No, I will never do that. Uh, I tell it like it is. And if anything, I'm going to take the more kind approach, but certainly I will let uh, a team or a program have it. I wanted to address two quick things here. So I don't see the comment here, so I apologize, but I think it's our guy. Uh, man, I'm not going to be able to pronounce his. Uh, there it is. Uh, Skanktopotamus. Uh, so he's saying that the Miami's not on TV. So I'm pulling up here the 2019 schedule. Shoot, I can watch almost any Miami game, and I'm sitting here in Connecticut. So Skanktopotamus, I'm looking at this. Okay, the Florida game, week zero, by itself, prime time, ABC, ESPN, whatever it was, all over the nation. So no questions there. The North Carolina game, I think, was the one of the premier first showcases for the ACC network, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Then we've got Bethune-Cookman, and unless you're a diehard, nobody else wants to see that game, so I'm not too concerned about that. Central Michigan, I don't know where that was available. No, that was just like local local, and also ACC. I had to watch it on the internet. It was that bad. Okay. 
Well, you're going to have that with a Mac school and certainly with Bethune-Cookman. Okay, the Virginia Tech game was on ESPN. The Virginia game was a Friday night on ESPN. Georgia Tech might have been an ACC network yep, game. Yep, also another ACC digital network. Pitt, I don't remember that one. It was a, it was a noon game. I think Pitt was on ESPN 2 or ESPN 3. You had to have a package to get that one. Uh, the Florida State game was either ABC or ESPN. It was a 3.30 game. Louisville was a 3.30 game, either like an ESPN 2 yeah. game. Then we had Florida International. So, again, those kind of games being played in November aren't necessarily going to get picked up. Uh, then you had Duke. That was a 3 o'clock game on a sat 3.30 game. There's another, anytime it says 3.30 on Saturday, that's one of the national games on an either ESPN, ESPN2, or one of the other ones. Then, uh, of course, the Louisiana Tech game, being a bowl game, of course, was on national TV. So outside of like three games, Skank Depotamus, yes, you can watch Miami football. You can be anywhere. You can be in Montana. You, you can be like the awesome one there in South Dakota, North Dakota. I get them mixed up. North Dakota. You can be in Alaska, and you can watch Miami play 10 out of 12 games, 11 yeah. out of 13. Yeah. So I think that was probably a shot at us, which we <laughs> definitely deserve <laughs> at this point. You know, you, you go seven and six, six and seven, uh, and, and in those two teams have 15 players drafted. That should tell you something. One thing I want to hit you on and, and get your take on, now that you brought up the name for the most likely the starting quarterback for 2021 in Nicosi Peria, what is your evaluation of Nikosi Perry as a quarterback now that you've seen him play for a few years? Oh, uh, the, the good and the bad. The good with his arm, he can keep you in any game. Uh, the team reacts to him differently. I mean, you watched him in 2018 uh, with his first start of North Carolina. Uh, you watched him. In 2000, and then the comeback versus Tallahassee, I will forever love him for that, forever. Uh, you know, uh, 2019, you saw him and shooting us and throwing us back in the game against Virginia Tech. But then you also turn on the film of the Virginia game. You turn on the film of the Pitt game, the Georgia Tech game, uh, where Miami went one and three in those games. Um, well, one of four, excuse me. When it comes to Nikosi Perry, he's someone that I believe his habits were never coached and changed properly to where this year is so important for his future because he's going to have to rely on his film evaluation. He's going to have to rely on great preparation because he won't be a start. He will have to be a emergency guy who comes in the game. And when you have guys like that, who have been a starter before, has lost a job, has been injured, has been healthy, uh, has been continuously pushed to the wayside, whether it be by our own fan base, whether it be by uh, a coach who continued to say a guy who's no longer a part of our program now was his guy, was the Miami guy, and that guy was hurt. And the coaching went out and fought you and put you back in the game and you refused to give him much credit. Uh, if you have a guy like that on the team, you know, he's going to be self-motivated. So I would say that Nikosi Perry is a quarterback who, taking the year as a step back, he's going to graduate this year. Uh, I hope and pray we're able to hold on to him going into 2021. Uh, if not, then he will be a grad transfer that goes elsewhere and does his thing. Uh, he's Miami through and through. He's a guy who – like I said, his arm, his touch is off. His touch is pretty, pretty bad. I mean, he throws darts no matter what. I mean, he he just he just beams it, throws it straight through, um, you know, like he's trying to put it through a door. Similar to Cam Newton, as far as with that, as far as the fact that Cam throws a bomb just as hard as he throws a slant, <laughs> and 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 I love Cam, but that's a big issue for him. And I think that that's, that's the issue as far as how he throws in the trajectory of his arm and the talent of his arm when it comes to Nikosi Perry. Uh, I think that Red Lashley is going to be big for him in teaching him how to throw the football properly.
but he has all the potential. He has all the ability. And he can be a uh, a very, very good starting QB here at Miami. And could honestly, if we were to give him just an entire year of confidence, I could see him winning nine, 10 plus games. Uh, but like I said, Kosey Perry, great arm, can throw you into any game. We'll have some gunslinger interceptions. We'll have some deep ball inaccuracies, but his energy and the way he's a football player and he makes some game winning plays. Uh, and he's a guy that I just would love if Miami were to get behind and, and really let him just go out here and play a 12 game season. We appreciate the comments, the questions, everything that uh, everyone brought to the table today. Certainly if you didn't have your comment or question addressed, uh, copy and paste it, leave it in the comment section of any of the videos. Uh, we will get to them uh, possibly next week. We got the wholesome one right here talking Miami football. So jump on over, do it. Wholesome one Holloway right on YouTube. Just boom, do the search. H-O-L-S-U-M. There it is right there. You know how to spell it. H-O-L-S-U-M. You you're going to find it right on YouTube and you hit the subscribe button and you lock it in on Miami football content. You can do that here as well. I've got all sorts of stuff planned for the next uh, several weeks in regards to team previews and top five player rankings in various conferences and much, much more here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Awesome one. Tremendous job. We appreciate you coming by and uh, laying down the knowledge. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for everybody who was able to make the live squad, man. Make sure you hashtag rewatch squad. Uh, like Mark has already given me my shout out. You guys can go ahead and subscribe to the channel, man. And uh, I give you the best uh, content that I can. And uh, as you can see, I love to break down film. I love to talk about this sport and uh, hopefully be a big time head coach one day. So. Make it Absolutely. And uh, as the wholesome one pointed out, uh, we've got 101 on the line right now. So as is always the case, we've got the most people always. on the line at the end of the show. So what you need to do is you just wait for the uh, video to post. Should take uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes, something in that range and watch it uh, in regards to what you missed uh, on the live version. See everyone next time. We got Florida State football talk tonight at seven o'clock. I know that, that causes everyone to cringe just a little bit. But we do talk Florida State football tonight at 7 o'clock live. So jump on here, Miami fans, and trash talk it up with those folks from Tallahassee. Hey, wish them the best, man. Wish them the best. And uh, hopefully both programs could come back to being in the top five. And I think that would be great uh, for college football. And, and maybe we can see something that we all expected to have had happened a long, long time ago, and that would be a Miami-Florida State ACC championship game. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if my heart could take that one. Oh, no, 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 no. It would, it, theoretically, for people who are not fans of both teams, that would be great. But for me and my dismay of that institution and program, ah, to have to see them on a championship stage, man. <laughs> I have to make sure I have no furniture that I care about around me during that game. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, reminder, Murder Blaze, to everyone to uh, like and subscribe. But, man, I got to tell you, Wholesome One, if you had told me back when both schools, well, of course, for Florida State, it was back around 1992, 93, something in that range, 95, that yeah. they did the ACC uh, for Miami was, what, 2003-ish, 4? 2005. Yep. You just said in 2005, okay, Miami's now in the ACC. Okay, it's 2020. Had Miami and Florida State played in an ACC championship game, I would have said, yeah, maybe three, four, five. I mean, we never held our side of the bargain with that one. Yeah. I can't blame them. They they were there. I mean, how they many were there. championships have they won there? 20? 18? ACC titles for them? Yeah. Well, since 95, it's been 25, 26 years. I don't know if they would have that many, but man, they ripped off. Oh my goodness. From the time they joined until about 02, 03, they owned it. I think they went like 10 straight. Yeah, they Something won like, like 10 that. straight. And then I they would also. Say at least 17, Mark. At least 17, because that's something they always. Okay. You know, yeah. When, when my, when. 
the ACC Digital Network was giving Miami a lot of shout outs and doing the whole uh, the rivalry uh, wide kick left and, and, and wide right uh, series. It was a lot of their fans. They were like, why are you guys showing the games that we lost? Why are you guys uh, showing a Miami when they've never even won your conference? Why are you giving them so much love? They had a point. So, oh, well. here, here we here we go. We might as well look it up and run it down here. So Miami or Florida State, as mentioned, joined the ACC in 1992. So they instantly, boom, jumped on it and owned it. Florida State, 1992, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000. So there are nine consecutive. They did tie twice because this was prior to the conference championship game. So nine consecutive conference championships. Then they they missed all of one year. Uh, Maryland won it in 01. Then Florida State jumped back in in 02 and 03. So there's 11. 05 is 12. 2012 would be 13. 2013 would be 14 conference championships. And 2014 would be 15 conference championships. Clemson and then Clemson went, went on their uh, run now. 15 wow. for Florida State since 1995. So 95 through 19, that's what, 25 seasons. No, I'm sorry, 92 through 19 would be 28 seasons. So they've won it 15 of 28 times. We've gone once. Yay. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we got a lot of work to do, Mark. We got a lot of work to do. And what I love about what's going on is for the first time in a while, this staff has their head down working. Ain't blabbering, working. Ain't retweeting and, and quote tweeting and they're working. And I'm happy to see that. Jalil Johnson to uh, respond to your comment there, thinking that Florida State joined the ACC in 1990. Actually, they they may have joined, signed the contract, as it says here in 1990, but they did not compete for a football championship until 92. So in 91, they let them play the league, but they were not um, eligible to win the championship in 91. 92 was the first year Florida State could have won the ACC, and they did start their run of winning ACC championships right there. All right, sir. Man, thanks for coming by. As always, sorry to leave it on a down note. <laughs> there. No, and it, it, it's up the Florida State championships. Yeah, hey, well, we're three and over some right now, so we're gonna we're gonna love it up some and appreciate it and uh you know, we'll we'll make your four here soon, so it's all right. All right. Wholesome all one, right. you have a great rest of your day. You too. Everybody out there, Florida State has Seminoles Live's coming up at 7 o'clock Eastern time tonight, so please join us then. We will see you next time.